Hello everyone and welcome to Fair Territory World Series Edition. We are coming to you quite obviously from Arizona, from Phoenix, Arizona. You can see the backdrop here. I can assure you that this show will never have a better backdrop than we will have today. Uh, and try to focus on the show and not just look behind me and try to listen to what I'm saying. Actually, if you want, just look at the backdrop. It's really beautiful and it is a beautiful place here. We're going to have great weather. Supposedly, the roof might be open for Game 3. Hallelujah! Outdoor baseball, maybe even Game 4 and 5 as well. We'll see. So far, we have seen in this World Series some excellent baseball. Game 1, I'm hesitant to say an all-time classic, but it was pretty up there. And if you go back and look at that game and compare it to other great World Series games in history, it would compare favorably. We saw a game-tying home run in the ninth inning, a two-run shot by Corey Seager, a walk-off by Adolis Garcia in the 11th. It was just a fantastic baseball game. Game two was pretty good, too. 4-1 in the seventh inning. It got out of hand, of course. The Diamondbacks ran it up. That contact offense, that pressure-oriented offense that they have and are so good with, it was on full display. And we also, in that game, saw a brilliant performance from Merrill Kelly. Seven innings, one run. Three hits in this game that he allowed. Two were soft contact. One was on a sinker that was down around Mitch Garver's shoes. So Merrill Kelly was brilliant. The problem now, as we go forward in the World Series, is that I don't think it's going to be quite as pretty as the first two games were. Not that they were necessarily pretty and beautifully played, though at times they were. But the high quality that we saw in those two games... From a pitching standpoint, it might be a situation where we're about to go a little south, a little sideways. Game three, Monday night, that will be Max Scherzer, who has pitched only six and two-thirds innings in his two starts this postseason. Remember, he's coming off that injury that he had in September. It's quite shocking that he's pitching at all, but he is pitching. He just hasn't built up yet. Now, will he be better tonight than he was previously? I would expect that. He's getting better each start, progressing, but... It's not the old Max Scherzer. I don't think anyone should expect that. And for the Diamondbacks, their rookie who has been brilliant in the postseason so far, especially in Game 7 of the NLCS, Brandon Fott. This is a kid with great stuff. This is a kid like Scherzer who is not going to pitch, or at least is not expected to pitch, deep into this game. We're probably talking about 18 hitters, plus or minus 4 hitters. That's how Diamondbacks manager Tori Lovellos described it yesterday. So I'm expecting a bullpen-type game tonight, or at least heavy use of relievers. And I'm also expecting that in Game 4, which is probably going to be a bullpen game for both teams regardless. So what am I saying? I'm saying we could see a lot of runs over the next couple of days. And it would not surprise me at all to see this thing kind of get a little hairy. It could be exciting with the offenses coming into play because we have a historically good offense in the Rangers from a power standpoint and historically good offense from the Diamondbacks from a running standpoint, right? These two teams play it a little bit differently. Historically good might be an overstatement. I'll admit that. But these are two very good but very different offensive type teams. And yes, I'm also expecting that we're going to go at least six and probably seven. Why do I say that? I have a difficult time believing that one of these teams is that much better than the other to win the next three. These two teams are too close, and I just can't see over the next three nights how one is going to just run the table here and prevail each night because we have a closely competitive series here. We have pitching that cannot be entirely trusted to be dominant. I guess I could see a scenario where the Diamondbacks steal one tonight with thought, and maybe they survive the bullpen game tomorrow, and then you get to game five. You've got the game one starters, Evaldi and Gallon, but Gallon hasn't been that great this postseason. So, again, entertainment is in store here, and we've already seen a lot of entertainment if you think about it. But Dolis Garcia in game one, it was incredible what he did. On base five times, leaping catch at the wall, stolen base, and of course, the walk off homer. 22 postseason RBIs. That's a single postseason record. I know we have expanded postseason. Yeah, he has more opportunities, but he's 22 RBIs this postseason, and no one has done that before under this format or any other. You can see the all-time leaders right there. Garcia with 22, 
David Fries with 21, Corey Seager 20, followed by Ortiz, Sandy Alomar, and Scott Spezio, each with 19. Remarkable performance so far by Garcia. He has become, as I wrote recently, one of the true superstars of the game. And he is continuing to emerge as this clutch, cool, entertaining type player. Cattell Marte, 18-game hitting streak in the postseason. That has never been done before. And he's 18 and counting going into tonight. All 18 games he's played in the postseason in his career, he has gotten a base hit in. And I know it took him until the eighth inning in game two, but he got it done. And it's a record, and it's something that, if you look at historically how many guys have struggled in the postseason, how many big-time players have struggled, it's pretty rare to see one this consistent over this period of time. Cattell Marte, I don't know that he's a superstar, but he is an all-star type player, a really good player, and he's done some big things. So I am excited to see what is going to happen over the next three days, especially. We definitely have three games remaining. And it's interesting tonight as well. The Diamondbacks behind fought. What are they going to do? Well, they've got three left-handers in their bullpen. We've seen all of them so far. Kyle Nelson, Joe Mantiply, and Andrew Salfrank. There is that pocket in the Rangers' order. It's a small pocket. Corey Seager at the number two spot. Evan Carter at the number three spot. Both left-handed. That is the pocket the Diamondbacks are going to be concerned about. And we might see these lefties come into play there. And we're going to see another pitcher from the Diamondbacks, Ryan Nelson, their long guy, or a former starter, or actually a current starter that they're using in relief. He is going to come into play in these next couple of games as well. So from the big picture, we've got a good World Series. We've got a competitive World Series. And I went through this last week. You might be a Yankee fan. You might be a Red Sox fan, a Dodger fan, an Astro fan, whatever the case might be. A Met fan, a Padre fan. And you might be disappointed your team's not here. I get it. But if you're a baseball fan, and I'll say this again because it's worth repeating. If you're a baseball fan, I would expect that you like watching the Diamondbacks in particular play. They play... I don't know that it's an old school style. It's sort of a new rule style, right? With the stolen bases, with the bunting that they're doing, with the running. It's an adaptation to the sport as it's being played today. And they adapted more quickly and perhaps better than most other teams. They had the players to do it. Corbin Carroll and Alec Thomas, guys like that. And even some of their other players that you would not expect would be running. Christian Walker is one of them. Do that kind of thing. Evan Longoria with the bunt in game two. That was brilliant, right? So it's a fun brand of baseball to watch. And the Rangers, a team that plays more like we've seen in recent years. Slug is the big part of their game. They're exciting too. Corey Seager, my goodness, he's one of the top 10 players in the game, if not the top five. Adolis Garcia, I just mentioned him, emerging superstar. Evan Carter, 21-year-old rookie, doing some amazing things on the big stage. So there is a lot here. There is a lot of meat on the bone. And again, to go back to where we started, I'm looking forward to seeing how this all evolves over the next few days. I expect it to be a bit messy, but I expect it to be really interesting. We have the potential, at least, for Max Scherzer to be Max Scherzer in October. We have the potential for Brandon Fought to do what he did in Game 7 of the NLCS. All kinds of things are in play. I'm going to have a lot of fun covering it. I hope that you guys have a lot of fun watching it. One other thing I want to get to in the open this week, and it concerns one of the managerial vacancies, the New York Mets, and the news that they are going to interview Craig Council to be their next manager. This is the most interesting dynamic going right now with all the openings that we have, right? Council is the manager most in demand. His contract is up actually this week. The Mets have permission to interview him. They're going to interview him. And the question becomes, actually, there are two questions here. One, does Craig Council want to manage the New York Mets? And two, do the New York Mets want Craig Council? My friend Joel Sherman of the New York Post wrote about this last week. It's a two-pronged thing. Now, what Council wants, at least what I'm hearing, what we have all heard, is to be one of the higher paid managers, if not the highest paid in the game. Craig Council, when he was a player, was an active member of the union. He was a guy who was involved in CBA negotiations, 
knew exactly what was going on, kind of informed his sensibility there going forward as he became a manager. He has the same kind of thinking. He wants to push the envelope for manager salaries, wants to raise the bar for manager salaries, and he's in position to do that. The team that is most equipped to set the bar for manager salaries, we all know, is the team that is owned by Steve Cohen. But then the question becomes, will the Brewers raise his salary enough or increase his salary enough from about $3.5 million to the point where he would not want to go to New York, where he would say, okay, I don't need to go there. And with the Mets, who were being run by David Stearns, admittedly Craig Council's former boss in Milwaukee, would they be willing to turn it over to Craig Council, hire him as their manager? Maybe David Stearns, as new president of baseball operations, wants a younger type manager that he would have more control over. I don't know. And Craig Council certainly is a guy who can work with David Stearns, but you know how it is today. The presidents of baseball operations like a lot of collaboration, and maybe they like a guy they can shape a little bit more than they can shape a veteran manager like Council. These are all unanswered questions right now. We don't know how this is going to play out, but as it plays out, it's going to be interesting because it's possible, a long shot, but possible, Teams with existing managers get in the mix for Craig Council. Would you be willing to fire your manager for Craig Council? Don't raise your hand if you're a fan. I'm sure that most fans would be willing to fire their manager for Craig Council. But the bottom line is, he has a choice here. He is a free agent. He is the guy that is kind of the it manager right now. I can't offer a prediction here. I don't know. If I had to guess, I would probably guess that he ends up back in Milwaukee. But man, there's a lot in play here. And there's a lot that can go in a different direction. I'll say one more thing about this. If David Stearns wants a younger type manager, a less established guy, that carries its own risk in New York. New York is not a place to break in a manager. I'm sorry. I know the Yankees did it with Aaron Boone. Aaron Boone, I would suggest, is kind of a unique guy. He had the playing background. He had the broadcast background. He has an ability to communicate that is rare among managers. So while he was a first-time manager, he had been in media, he could handle media, he was equipped to do it. And I know Yankee fans might disagree, but he also has been very successful for the most part. Is he perfect? No. But he has not been overwhelmed by that job. At the same time, you bring in a guy who is someone who's been a manager and waiting I'm not so sure that works too well in New York. We saw it with Luis Rojas. It's not a place where you learn on the job. So Council really is an ideal choice, but do they want him? Does he want to come? Do the Milwaukee Brewers pay what needs to be, in his mind, the salary he deserves? All of these things, again, are unanswered. Time now for the Inside Dish. This is the part of the show where I go inside a story I've written or maybe inside a trend going on in the game. Today, I've got something different for you, and it's something I've talked about with my friends in the past. People ask me about, but I've never really talked about publicly. Don't worry, it's not a great secret or anything like that. But I'm going to take you through what it's like to cover a World Series game from my perspective as someone who works for two outlets, The Athletic, where I write, and Fox Sports, where I do dugout reporting all season long and during the postseason. It's two jobs. And yes, it comes into play here where both are going on at the same time. Now, I'm not going to give you this overview because I'm telling, because I'm trying to tell you how great I am, because of how much I want to show you how hard I work. You're going to get a gist of that, not the greatness part, but the, maybe the working part. But I just kind of want to explain how this all gets done, how the sausage is made, so to speak. So generally, each day is different. In the case of today, as we get ready for game three, I'm coming off an off day where I attended the workouts for each team, got some stuff ready for the game. But the day begins with me typing up notes for the broadcast, and I'll usually prepare about 15 to 20 topics. Now, obviously, I'm not on the air 15 to 20 times during a game. That would not be realistic. But I want these things ready. I want them at my disposal. And our play-by-play -play guy, Joe Davis, will occasionally draw from them in what he is saying during the game. So he might refer to something 
that I've given him or that Tom Verducci has given him and use that on the air as just part of his natural flow. That's part of what I do, giving information to the play-by-play -play man. And everything I'm about to tell you, Tom Verducci does exactly the same thing. He writes for SI.com after every game. He prepares as a dugout reporter just as I do. So we're doing essentially the same kind of thing. So I prepare those notes, type them up, send them in. We print them out for each announcer. And then I get to the game. Usually this year, we have been leaving for the park five hours before the game. And the reason for that is our meetings with the managers. And yes, the broadcasters meet separately with each manager before each game. Those meetings have been taking place earlier than usual. The managers, in this case, Bruce Bochy and Tori Lovello, want to get the meetings out of the way. They have other media responsibilities. They have a lot going on. Oh, and yet they're preparing for the game as well. So we start with those meetings. And during that time, we also get access to the players in the clubhouse for about 15 minutes with each team. So I can go talk to a player I might have a question for and ask him that privately without any other media there. It's an advantage. It's something that as a broadcaster, as part of Fox, which pays whatever they pay for these things, that's the privilege we get. And from there, sometimes I pick up a few more nuggets for the game. After that, generally speaking, I do a pregame interview on camera with somebody in the game that day, usually a player, but sometimes a manager. Tonight it's going to be Bruce Bochy. And also prepare a report for the pregame show, which I will generally do live an hour before the game. The other thing I am preparing for at that time, while talking to players and doing all different things, is my report at the top of the show, the one that you see right before first pitch, the one you see that I do with Tom Verducci. One of us will start, the other one will continue, and then generally the game will begin. That report lasts about 30 seconds in most cases. It's difficult to do because it's live. The stadium is loud at that time. I would say it is the most difficult thing I do on television because you have to nail it. You have to have it pretty much memorized because if you miss, you can't just say, mm, I'd like to start over or you can't lose your train of thought because the game's about to begin. So the game begins and then we get into the natural flow of the game. And I'm talking to my producer, a guy named Pete Macheska, who has been my producer and the producer of Fox for longer than I've even been there, which is 18 years now. And Pete has to organize the entire show. I'm not sure exactly what he does because I've never been in the truck, but he has to get in different kinds of ads. He has to get in different elements, graphics that we prepared for the game. And of course, he has to monitor the game at all times and talk to Joe Davis and John Smoltz and what they're thinking and prepare video and graphics and all kinds of things as the game progresses. It's a little chaotic. It's very cool. It's amazing what Pete Macheska, the producer, and Matt Gangle, our director, pull off during the course of a game, as well as all of our camera people, audio people, people in the truck. It's quite a production. So during the game, I'll be giving a couple of reports during the game. I'll be, of course, doing those in-the-moment interviews if they become appropriate. And then the game ends. I interview a player, sometimes two. This is something we've been talking about through the eighth and ninth innings, trying to get organized, trying to figure out who the right players to interview are. Obviously, a situation like game one, where there is a walk-off, your plans go to smithereens and you just have to adapt right at the end, which is a lot of fun. It's also a little bit hairy because you're not always as ready as you would be, but that's the beauty of live television. After that, I unhook, I take off my wires, and get ready to do my other job, which is for The Athletic and writing about that game that night. I'll go into the clubhouse, talk to players, whoever I need to talk to, to get ready for the story that I'm about to write. I've already spoken with The Athletic's other writers. We've divided up the topics and tried to do it the best we can to make sure all of the angles are covered and represented. And then generally speaking, I'll go back to where our production trucks are where they have food post-game. I haven't eaten since like, I don't know, 12 hours before. I'll eat something or I'll take it back with me to our hotel and I'll write at the hotel. I need a little bit of time to unwind, to collect my thoughts, to eat. And then I'll write and usually I'll be writing until about 3 in the morning Eastern time. And then we get up the next day and we do it all again. Now again, 
I'm not saying this because I want people to think I'm some kind of amazing person or amazing journalist or anything like that. I'm just trying to give you insight into the work that goes into it. And I want to make one thing especially clear. I love doing this. It is an absolute privilege to do this. And I will do this as long as The Athletic and Fox Sports lets me do it. Is it tiring? Of course it's tiring. I'm really tired. I'm tired all the time during the postseason. But you go on adrenaline in a lot of ways, and you're fired up to be there. And I fully recognize that all you guys listening and all you people watching, almost all of you would love to do what I do. And again, it's work. Yes, it's work. It's hard work. But it is an absolute honor, and I feel really lucky every year to be standing on the field during the World Series, to be part of the broadcast, to be writing about the World Series. Not a lot of sports writers get that privilege. So the whole thing, while it's difficult and while it's tiring and while people might think, yeah, you're a little nuts for doing all this, I don't care. I'll do it, and I'll do it as long as they let me. Time now for the Dude of the Week, and I'm really excited to talk about this particular dude. It is someone that was not nominated by Jock Peterson, but maybe it's someone who would have been nominated by Jace Peterson. Obviously two different players, but two who have now a strong connection to Tommy Pham. Tommy Pham is the Dude of the Week, and if you haven't heard by now, Tommy Pham did something that was so selfless in Game 2, so cool, that it not only merits Dude of the Week, it merits a lot of introspection and praise for what he actually did. And if you haven't read it again, what he did was, with a 4-for-4 four four game in progress, with a chance to tie Paul Molitor and Albert Pujols for the all-time record, five hits in a World Series game, he went up to his manager, Tori Lovello, in the eighth inning and said, you know what, I need you to give my boy in at bat. Tommy Pham's boy was Jace Peterson. These are both veteran players. Pham is 35, Jace Peterson's 33. They've been together with the Diamondbacks this year. And Tommy Pham, even though he was 4 for 4, even though he was on the verge of tying a record, which he was not aware of, by the way, he wanted Jace Peterson to experience a World Series at bat. And you could say, well, wait a second. Jace Peterson would have gotten it at bat at some point. Who knows? Uh, I don't know that you can guarantee that. You don't know how these games are going to go. Jace Peterson's a utility guy. He might appear, he might not appear. But Tommy Pham wanted to make sure he did appear. So Tori Lovello told Pham, okay, deal, but if our lead is smaller than 7-1, which is what it was at the time, 7-1 over the Rangers, uh, no, you're staying in the game. You're 4-4. Four four. Pham said, okay, the lead did stay at 7-1 and actually increased after Jace Peterson got in the game as a pinch hitter. And it ends, of course, with a 9-1 Diamondbacks victory. Tommy Pham, I wrote a story about him with Will Salmon of The Athletic about a month ago. Actually, more than a month ago at this point. He is not the guy you think he is. Not the guy who slapped Jock Peterson and will be forever more known as that guy. He is one of the game's hardest workers. I would say he is one of the game's most serious players. And you can see from this interlude, he's also a guy who cares an awful lot about his teammates. What was interesting about this in talking to both players yesterday is that Jace Peterson said it's not that unusual to have something like this happen. He referred back to 2018 when he was teammates with Adam Jones with the Orioles. And Jace Peterson was closing in on an incentive for plate appearances. So say he needed 250 to cash a $50,000 incentive. I'm not saying that's what it was. That's just an example. Maybe he was a few plate appearances short and Adam Jones told the manager at the time, I guess it was Buck Showalter, give this kid some at-bats. Let's see if we can get him to the incentive. He didn't get there, but the same kind of selfless thing was in play. That's good, what Adam Jones did, but what Tommy Pham did in a World Series game in which he's 4-4, four for four, that is outstanding. And that is just actually shocking in some ways. So Tommy Pham, due to the week, that was an easy choice. Dork of the week, I can't believe I'm saying this, because in baseball, every week, people do stupid things. But there is no dork of the week this week. I don't have anybody that I really want to nominate or throw out there as dork of the week. Everyone has been on fairly good behavior. I would even include the commissioner of baseball on that. I would even include the umpires. All the people who are the usual suspects. We haven't had any ownership missteps. We haven't had anything really go wrong. 
So let's hope that we can repeat this next week and have no dork of the week. Although I would strongly suspect that some candidate will emerge. Give your playoff game face your best look with our new sponsor, Shady Rays. The Shady Rays is an independent sunglass company that has a world-class product just as good as all of the expensive sunglasses that are out there. They have durable frames, extremely clear optics for outdoor adventures, and what really separates Shady Rays is the best protection plan in the industry. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, Shady Rays will send you a brand new pair with no questions asked. And if you don't love your Shady Rays, doubtful, you can exchange them for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. So you can buy and wear your Shady Rays knowing that the company has your back. Shady Rays are giving out right now the best deal that they have this season. It's 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. So use the code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for 50% off and try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. Time now for Grilling Ken. This is the part of the show where I answer your questions. And let's start this week with one that I am pretty sure is coming from the city of Toronto or somewhere close by because it comes from a Blue Jays fan. The question is, what are the Jays going to do in the offseason? It comes from Rocky A. And Rocky A is curious, like a lot of people, about what the Jays have in store. First order of business is their free agents. And they have a number of free agents on the offensive side in particular. I'm talking about Kevin Kiermeyer and Brandon Belt and Whit Merrifield and, of course, the third baseman, Matt Chapman, who will be one of the more coveted position players on the open market. They also have Hyun Jin Ryu, whose contract is up. He is a free agent. And Chad Green, who has kind of a funky option, and he ultimately could be a free agent as well and probably a reliever in demand. So what I expect the Jays to do is try to replace some of those offensive pieces. That's going to be priority one. And it's going to be difficult because those are some pretty valuable guys. Merrifield, quite valuable. Matt Chapman, of course, extremely valuable in many ways, the defensive side especially. I also expect them to explore extensions with Vlad Jr. and Bo Bichette. But in Vlad Jr.'s case, I'm not sure they know what they're getting at this point or what they have. I should put it that way. He had an off year, let's face it, and I'm sure they want to see him play a little bit better before they get into serious extension talk. Bo Bichette, different story. He's been fairly consistent. Those guys are going to be tough to sign. As you get closer to free agency, it only gets more difficult. But the Jays, their first priority will be putting a 2024 team together that will perform better, ultimately, in the clutch in the postseason than the 2023 one did. Next question, let's see what we have here. It comes from Zachary Goldstein, who asks, Ooh, what team is the most likely one to acquire Juan Soto? Well, we've already heard some talk about the Yankees, and clearly they should have interest. But let's talk about Juan Soto a little bit and who he is at this stage of his career. He is one year away from free agency. Premier offensive player, no question about that. Defense and base running, not totally what you would want, but an elite, elite offensive guy. He's going to make probably an arbitration about $30 million this year. So that, in theory, should depress the price, should make the Padres less demanding in what they get back for Juan Soto than what they gave for him when they acquired him with two plus years of control remaining. It's not the same kind of trade. You're taking on all that money and you're getting far less control. So who can do this kind of trade? Which teams can make this kind of deal? It would have to be a team most likely with money to spend and a team that believes it can extend Juan Soto. Good luck with that. Scott Boris is his agent. He wants to go to free agency. He's going to want to set a standard with Juan Soto. Most teams can take on a single salary of $30 million, even the Tampa Bay Rays, a team like that, for one year. The question is, would such a team be willing to give up the prospects necessary to get Soto? Maybe the Rays would. They're a team that has been aggressive in these kinds of things over the years that they haven't really succeeded in any of their quests. But the more likely scenario is that it's a team with money and prospects. A team like the Yankees, the Cubs, the Red Sox. I would throw the Giants in that category, though I don't know that they would be willing to do that kind of deal. Farhan Zaidi as president of baseball operations, I don't know that it's his thing. The Yankees 
perfect fit. Soto, the left-handed bat they need. A star going forward if they choose to re-sign him. It makes all the sense in the world. And they have young players to, to trade. Cubs the same. I don't know that they would be as aggressive as the Yankees. Red Sox, they'd have to move Verdugo in some other kind of deal, but he would make a lot of sense for them too, and their incoming president of baseball operations, Craig Breslow. I could create other scenarios as well, but those teams would be among the ones that I would expect would be involved with Juan Soto. Finally, last question comes from Lindsey Day, and Lindsey wants to know, what makes Otani a championship player when his salary will eat too much of a team's payroll to make them competitive? These are two different questions. Lindsay, Shohei Otani, I would expect most of us would agree, is a championship caliber player. Now, he won't be a pitcher next year, but he's one of the top five hitters in the game. I would think you'd want him on your team. The question you raise, though, is an interesting one. Let's say his average annual salary in this new contract is in the 40 to $50 million range, which is probably a reasonable expectation. That does eat up a large chunk of payroll. It does force a team that signs Otani to at least think differently about where it is going forward with its payroll and financial situation. Obviously, teams can afford this. We know this. Some team and multiple teams are going to bid for Shohei Otani. But yeah, it would require you to probably take your payroll past the luxury tax threshold, past maybe two or three luxury tax thresholds, and there are teams certainly that are equipped and willing to do that. The Dodgers, most prominent among them. They've been preparing for this moment, in fact, with Otani. So the larger question competitively becomes, okay, why do you want to tie up your DH long term when teams generally use that spot now to alternate players, to give guys a rest? Is that healthy for what you want to do? And the other aspect of that is once he is pitching again, it becomes a little tougher in maintaining a five-man rotation because you need six with Otani and the rest he needs built in. So there are these factors in play, and some teams might balk at all that, say, you know what, we can build a team differently without him at a lesser cost. That might be a more efficient way of going about it. Teams will look at it that way, but Otani is this otherworldly figure. He is also a one-man marketing bonanza. Some team is going to pay him. I wrote this after we learned that he would need elbow surgery. I still expect him to get $500 million. All right, we talked about this last week, but I want to bring it up again because it's a very special event in memory of one of my good friends, Pedro Gomez. His foundation is hosting a golf tournament and an auction not far from where I am right now in Phoenix. It's going to be in Chandler, Arizona. It's going to take place December 2nd at the Whirlwind Golf Club in Chandler. Now, here you see the details. The golf tournament and auction is December 2nd. If you sign up for the tournament, you get breakfast, golf, a drink ticket, range balls, golf balls, and a golf shirt or windbreaker or Yeti. There will be live music, cocktails, and awards afterwards along with the auction. All proceeds go to student scholarships. So you can use the QR code on the screen for information and to sign up. Just one more word on the foundation. They do some really cool things for young journalists, student journalists. They give out scholarships, as you saw right there, and I was at their event last January and met one of the honorees and these are impressive young people and we need good young journalists coming into the business. This is something Pedro was extremely passionate about and I know if he were with us today, this is something that he would be active in. So support the Pedro Gomez Foundation. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for your questions. You know where to find us, to subscribe to us, to like us. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all the places where you get your podcasts. We will be back next week at the conclusion of the World Series, and we will start the off-season. Yes, the off-season, free agency, trades, and all of that good stuff. Have a great week, everyone. Hey, get in on the action with the FT fam at BetMGM. New customers use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for a $1,500 first bet offer. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least $10 into your BetMGM Sportsbook account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If that bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING.